It is. Stupid fight. It is. <laughs> A cookie's last game. Have you, Unfortunately, very have you heard about the, the game that Annie Rush made called The Secret Lives of Gingerbread Men? No, but it sounds awesome. If you do a Google search, you can find it. She's still selling the PDF off of her website, I think. Um, the premise of it is that gingerbread men come to life during the 12 days of Christmas. And you can only see them running around if you believe in Santa Claus. And she put a little Easter egg in it, or a little, you know, whatever, because I helped her publish it. Um, that because uh, there's a sample family in the book, which is her family and yeah. like her house yeah. and everything like that, except for the because uh, uh, you know I did the cat role yeah. game right, except for Uncle John who's visiting during Christmas mm-hmm. who has his his pet cat with him, and uh, John can Uncle John can see the gingerbread men because he still believes in Santa Claus. He still has that childish one. So yeah, I, that was very sweet of her. I didn't know she put that in the game. But yeah, that's it's a wonderful. So what happens is, is that your character sheet is you bake gingerbread men, and then the candy that you put on them is the powers that they have, is the magic that they have. And then as you take down, do you break off pieces and eat them? Yes. Well, it's, it's all about the gum drop. Nice. The terror that is Uncle John's cat believing in Santa Claus and yeah. chasing small skitter. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's the game. It's a wonderful little game. Yeah, I saw this and I'm like, it's like Candyland, only twisted. I love it. So we need potato salad. <laughs> Got me do right. I'm a human being. I can use tools. <laughs> Sign of being an evolved creature, right? Indeed. Right. I have an opposable thumb, rational mind, and the ability to use and make tools. Hey, are you on the panel? Or you're the, you're the... I'm actually on the panel, and I'm illustrating one uh, way to make your game master's job easier by showing up on time. The, this is an example of a, 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 a wrong way to do things. Isn't the game master panel something to eat? Nope. No, this is making your game guys, or your GMs, get the job easier. I made the okay. joke that. That, uh, that was one of my prime. Uh, <laughs> Before Firefly became a role-playing yeah. game, I used to make the joke that the fire that in the Firefly role-playing game, in that Joss Whedon was right running with his players, that River Tam was the player who never showed up, and so he gave he gave her this really powerful character, and all she does is you know go around the deck and, and you know give her, and then occasionally she shows up and like wrecks the game. She totally <laughs> but it right. seems like a gym but, run PC. Yeah, but yes. but then but then you know she goes away. You know she like shows up one game and like and I do these crazy things and then goes away for a week or for you know for a month. Right, right, right? and doesn't do anything. No, that's a good yeah, example. Yeah, at that point too. she totally needs to be an NPC because she has no other purpose except for be a sporadic character. She's yeah. more of an environmental we factor had a, at that yeah. point. We had a player character who um, may or may not have had a drinking problem at the time. And would show up and would start the party along this, you know, side quest rabbit hole of grave consequence, and then pass out halfway through the uh, the, the evenings. Which, wow, fun and the hilarity that ensued getting us in there was great. At a certain point, we got to the point of why are we all still here? And and oh my gosh, we're all gonna die because of. This snoring the guy's guy now is sleeping. Mistake. Yeah, yeah, and now and we're one body out because he's no good in a fight at this point. I mean, because we're still not we're not going to roll for him. He's right here. <laughs> right, he's got a non-entity at that point. Though. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, what are you here for? Um, seeing the mom. Oh, okay. <laughs> so you don't count. Oh, okay, she totally counts. You totally count. We'll put her on this. I'm being a, I'm actually, being a mean person. She I actually plays D and D. I'm sorry. <laughs> Me? What's that supposed to mean? Well, you, know, you should be playing a role playing game. Oh. Linda, <laughs> <laughs> well, no, would you like to explain to him about the boulder? Oh, okay. So I have a um, barbarian, and his name is the boulder. And he smishes things. That sounds like a rustling. He squishes and things, yeah. He, uh, no, he smishes. He's also the third uh, person, too. The boulder is awesome. Yes. 
the whole game that the boulder was around talked in third person. Yeah. So, what did you do that's so awful that you're being punished by being forced to play D&D? Summer <laughs> penalty. It, it's got to be. It's got to be something really awful. You're, you're a dreadful child. I can tell. Actually, uh, we started out with uh, big eyes, small mouth. bullying. If, if it was sincere, <laughs> that's, that's hilarious. <laughs> I'm sorry. sorry. What's 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 your name? I'm sorry. Melinda. What's, Melinda. I'm John. Hello. Hi. I also design role playing games. Mm-hmm. I design role playing games that are not D and D. Yes. Um, and and I have a reputation for giving D and D a hard time. That's true. So I, I, I have tell. to maintain my reputation. I can tell. Yeah, because if it never you won't want that to change. No, I really don't. People will say bad things. What's that? It's game pieces. Game. Obviously. Exactly. <laughs> Well, this panel's actually on time crunch because you guys need the room afterwards. So, where's the? There's a six o'clock panel. Where's that going to be? Is there a six o'clock? There is a six o'clock panel with me and Aldo on it, talking about. I thought you were saying that's at seven. seven. I think it's at seven. It's at seven oh, after okay. the cosplay thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You and Aldo are seven. Oh, okay. So that's the last yep. one tonight. Yeah, we're talking about Red Dragon and Werewolf and. But anyway, since we got to wrap up a little early, let's enjoy your time. Um, this one is on, you know, things to help out your GM. My perspective on that, though, is not really as a player, because I can't remember the last time I played in a game. I'm normally a GM, but there are some definite things that I think you can help out. And the big one for me is the the players that will kind of uh, pick up what you're putting down. The, you know, not... I mean, I like players to have fun and be able to do their own thing. But to some degree, if the GM's kind of painting certain things. Hey, hey, this is a, a, a brooding, gothic horror game. You need to kind of get on board with it being a brooding, gothic horror game and you're not playing your you slapstick. You brooding? Brooding. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. It's been a really long night. It's supposed to brooding, dude. Brooding. 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 It's a brooding game. Brooding, brooding. gothic. It's, it's like... Let's wear black makeup and play football in the dark. I like that. It's like I totally that, low That actually brown. wouldn't be a bad <laughs> setting. That would be a cool game. <laughs> Cthulhu, bro. Um, <laughs> think about Don't it. Cthulhu me, bro. <laughs> no, totally, uh, but no, I think stuff stuff like that, just participating in what the general kind of direction of Phil, not necessarily being railroaded, but we're, we're looking for a certain mood or a theme or an atmosphere, and actively participating in that, no, uh, as opposed to being kind of counter that. On, on, on a similar kind of note, I mean, I uh, I'm in a group where we do uh, we do short like three month campaigns where we each take turns running the game, so we can each take turns getting to play over the Oh, do you like switch games and GMs? Yeah, yeah. Months? So I mean, sometimes we go back to uh, standards and favorite characters and settings, but uh, we also like to try out new systems that we haven't all played as a group together. Sure. Um, but. Uh, uh, there's there's a certain amount of contract that you make uh, when reading a book and watching a movie with the, the writer or the director and the actors. It's a contract that you're going to give it a chance to get good. And it, there's a similar contract that has to happen between players and, and game masters is that it's 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 a contract that they're going to give they're going to go along with like you know what you're saying you know go along with the story pick up what you're putting down. Uh, but at the same time, um, they're they're also gonna play their character, not play uh, to the moment. Sure. You know, like filling in and just the mo- oh, this needs to happen. Well, I'm gonna get it done, just to get things done. But you, to it does your your GM a service to play your character, not just problem solve. I think some other things players can do to to make. You know, my life easier a chaotic is statement. working together nicely. Um, those little meta game things, like when you have the maybe the the shy player who doesn't come out much, help and put the spotlight on that person occasionally. Not always taking it yourself. Things that help kind of bring everybody into the game. You know, that that's other working things that as make a team while easier. yeah, meta teamwork while team player team. teamwork as opposed to necessarily character teamwork. Right, right, is a, a huge help to to making. Running the game a lot easier. I uh, I just always look at the other people in the game as my audience, <laughs> mm-hmm. right? And it's like, well, how am I entertaining them? How sure. am I how am I helping? 
Are they being entertained? Are they being entertained? Am I doing... Good question. Are they being really being entertained? Are they being entertained? Yeah. Because it's up... Because if they're not, then I better change up my plan. Am I just entertaining myself? Because sometimes that happens. Yeah, you shouldn't be doing that. Each game session is, an, uh, is another episode of the, you know, your, your soap opera. And you want that audience coming back and enjoying it and participating in it and being part of what's going on. i got to join the club here. Well, another thing that you have to look oh, yeah, at is the, the fact yeah, that um, well, when you talk about right. metagaming, um, recently I ran into a situation where half of the players uh, had already had another character that had run this specific scenario, and so they knew what was coming, but the other half hadn't, and so they were rushing me through the scenario. I'm like, guys, let me go through the scenario so that these guys can actually enjoy this. But uh, they're just like tripping me through it. Do they want to get through the all? Exactly. And I'm like, this does not make for a good role-playing experience. It makes for a good dice monkey experience at that point. But it's not a well balanced game. That doesn't help your GM or your fellow players. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Because you're not with like uh, at the same pace or on the same page with the rest of the story. Yeah. Well, in that case, you know the 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 other players should be helping you tell that story, right? The fun doesn't become the uncertainty of what's going to happen next. The fun becomes how can I help the GM entertain the other players? How can I help the GM set up the stuff that's going to happen? That, that's a situation where it actually should come off awesome because the two or three people who played it, they should be helping really build the whole atmosphere and everything for the players who have it. So you got kind of some almost co-GMs at that point, you know, help yeah. really tell the story yeah. and bring it up. I mean, you um, do that anyway as a GM and said, some, well, at least I do, sometimes I bring ringers in, mm -hmm. right? And that you have a whole coterie of ringers right there. They're they're ready, you know, to to you know help you do the thing that that you know make your job a little bit easier because they're they're doing the thing. If I've done that a couple of times. Trap, I promise you won't really get poisoned. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've done that at run the games at conventions before, where I've specifically had a a seventh player or whatever, six that signed up, and somebody I brought to to kind of help facilitate a little bit because I want to. Well, and sometimes convention games, you're, you're wrangling the cats a little bit, so you're trying to oh, yeah. keep them organized, and that can kind of help like that. Those are one of those things that I think um, share in the spotlight. That, that's a great quality. Uh, help and invest in the thing. Yes? Yeah, do you devote the uh, role of the seventh player to the other six? You know, I've gone both ways on that at different times. Sometimes I've told people that, hey, Bob here is kind of playing an NPC assistant of your guys's. And then I've actually gone the other way, not at all. You know, I, I have a great deal of trust in Bob there because we've played forever. They know what they're doing here. And I've never done it in a way that, like, that person's there to betray the party or do something like that because that, that feels kind of cheap to me. But to stir the pot. But, but to yeah. do something, to be a catalyst of some sort. Yeah, well, yeah. Whatever that is. In, in one case, it was someone who's going to die horrifically, <laughs> and then I asked him to leave. And the players all at the game thought, <laughs> but, 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 but I knew she had a game in like a half hour. That was all part of the plan. But it kind of invoked a mood that they were like, whoa, hold, hold like, on a minute. Where did this come from? Again, it may have been a little bit of a cheap parlor trick, but it really worked well Definitely for the that, game I was yeah. running, you know, for a, a convention game. I don't, I didn't use the, throw people out. I don't use the storyteller system for it anymore, but I, I have a, a World of Darkness. I, I run, when I run the World of Darkness games, I, I do it in the same city that I started in, which is St. Paul, Minneapolis which is where I was living at the time. And so I have a huge database of NPCs uh, that, that are PCs that other players you know, have played in the game. And then occasionally, uh, like uh, my buddy Jess Heinig, who's the line developer for Mage and, and Kindred of the East and a whole bunch of other stuff, um, he had played in my, my St. Paul, Minneapolis game, my Twin Cities game uh, for a while. And then uh, l l years later, other friends of mine were like, we really want to play in your in your Twin Cities game. And I was like, okay. And then and Jess happened to be visiting one the, on the week that they were playing. 
and I had him show up as, as his old character. And the idea that, that they were familiar with the game and they were familiar with, with the story of the city and, and things like that, and that just showed up as his character. And I said, okay, this is what I need you to do. This is what I, and took him aside and said, these, these are the goals and, and these are the things that are going on. You know, contributed so much to the game because it was like watching a TV show and a famous movie actor makes a cameo, right? It really added an element to the game that was outstanding. And, uh, and, and because he was an antagonist, and rather than, he's like a, he, he was like a, a, a reluctant al, you know, ally antagonist. It was, it was really fantastic to play. I've kind of an ongoing thing in my campaign that one of my players' best friends lives in the Bay Area. And about every other month, every third month, she'll happen to be up on a weekend when we're playing. So for the last about a year, she'll let me know when she's coming. I'll email her a quick update of whatever the campaign is we're currently playing and this guest appearance you're going to make. Uh, she's been like a, a scout who was hired in, in a town. Uh, she's been the captain of these people that they got hired by. Different genres, different games. It's been a few things over the last, I think we've been doing it about two years now. But after about the third time her character died, it's kind of become like this thing that whenever she shows up at the table... What horrific thing awaits her <laughs> character? Because she's never... It's obviously not there enough that she can play a character. But she'll play some fun... She's been a villain. She's been an ally. She's been a... The time that she was the princess that needed to be rescued was hysterical. Because she just played it over the top, being just a pain. This pandered to, spoiled, uh, you know, 14 or 15-year-old, I don't remember what it was, princess that just... Which was so much more effective than me describing that character to him. And that was great. It really pulled the party together. Did, that did last one. Hmm? Did the spoiled princess die? No. No, she successfully got rescued. I, I think the players were going to kill her. <laughs> she almost died by, by the little uh, PvP there. <laughs> but uh, that, was, that was a lot of fun. But again, one of those things where that's a... I mean, she's been prompted and coached and given some stuff to work with. But again, where she is directly working to make my job easier. And I think that's, um, I sometimes take, when one of my players has uh, kind of expressed a certain thing they want to do, I don't mean like in the moment, but just in general in the campaign, I want to go this direction, I kind of would like to do that. I usually like them to tell me that before they just run off and do something and kind of have that dialogue and agreement of how we're going to work with that in to the game so that it does become something that maybe I can pull everybody that direction and get some other people on board or at least get that player thinking that, while you may have a personal thing your character wants to do, that's cool, let's find ways together that we can make everybody kind of want to go on that. This chapter's about you, but everybody's cool with that. So I think um, that I watch a lot of gaming groups, and sometimes I don't think there's enough communication between GMs and players outside of the table. Like, I, I like to conference with my people all the time, just, you know, throughout the week, whether it's an email or a text, and just kind of, what are you feeling, what do you want that's all that stuff. I think we, you were here last night. We were talking about building that trust yeah. between GMs and players, where they know, yeah, if I talk to him about it, he's going to work in my thing, so I don't have mm -hmm. to force it in there. It'll happen more organically. Yeah. But that dialogue, that outside the table dialogue, really has to happen. Sometimes, having had bad experiences with previous GMs, players are reluctant to reveal what they want because they think the GM will like, you know, then work to keep that away from them. Yeah. So that comes back to the trust building. I feel bad because I run into that occasionally too and I feel like, oh man, you, sorry you've had to encounter that with somebody. I mean, I'm there to entertain my players and I want, I mean, sometimes I, I do something that may seem like, oh, but that failure is awesome and, and I'm there to help you have a great experience. That, that's what I'm shooting for. So, you know, I don't think I demand too much from them to do that, but it there's, is a group thing. There's a chapter in Play Dirty, uh, which is, uh, the mo I think it's called The Most Powerful Object in the Universe. Mm. And it came from me watching uh, the uh, Kurt Weigel's uh, uh, Game Geeks like g give GM advice, and it was about how do you make sure players don't your characters don't get too powerful. And I was like, what What are you talking about? Give them exactly what they want, right? And 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 uh, the the picture of it is really cute. It's it's a it's a rubber chicken <laughs> with the sign the most powerful <laughs> object in the universe, right? But it's, it's like, give them the most powerful object in the universe. Give them a Green Lantern ring. Sure. Why not? You know, Absolutely. Make, you know, it, it's, it, it, it's not, the question is not, can I get the most powerful object in the universe? 
The question is, can I survive having the most powerful object in the universe? And that's the key right there. Yeah. That's, you know. It's the Ring of Three Wishes in D&D. Okay. There you go. Here, have one. Have one. Have yeah. fun. Yeah. And then suddenly, Here, like, one for uh, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. Just one of them. Because yeah. yeah. then everyone else is going, you should, you know, wish for yeah. this thing. Yeah. We'll see if we yeah. can get through three wishes yeah. <laughs> with a party intact. Yeah, and just remember, you can't wish for more wishes. I agree with you, though. I, I don't hold back with my players. They, they want stuff, because I find it be much more interesting. What will, they, what will they do with it? How will they manage it? What type of responsibility? What, just, yeah, you want this power? There's power. Well, yeah, yeah. Like, Ooh. With, uh, with the, the group I mentioned where we, have, where we rotate who's uh, uh, the running the game, my, my slot's coming up next. Uh, we've been in the middle of Star Trek right now. Star Wreck. Uh, Star Wreck. <laughs> oh yeah, already blown up. I agree. Three shuttle keg craft. Yeah, whatever. It's fine. Um, but uh, I've been talking to the group for months about my game and what, you know, I was listening to, you know, the, the chatter, you know, the, sure. the smoke break chatter, that kind of thing, before and after game. And what kind of game that uh, haven't we done yet? What does everybody kind of want to do? And I got a feel for it. And, I've, in, in this case, I, I'm throwing together some, uh, basically a Suicide Squad type of uh, villains. We, let's just be villains with ultra powers. And here you go, guys. Instead of just evolving the, into that every campaign. <laughs> we'll just start right, by the yeah, I'm just it. going to start there and make them either blow the world up or find a soul. Wherever the game takes us. It's funny you mentioned, I was going to bring up Suicide Squad. My friend Rob Justice uh, ran a Suicide Squad game for the better part of a year. And um, and at one point, the best the best session that we had was when Amanda Waller came to us and said, "Okay, your mission is to kill Batman." Good luck with like, that. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? There you, go. you know, and 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 that was the cliffhanger of one episode, right? Oh, geez. And then yeah. is, we want you to kill Batman. And then the next episode was us Son. spending four hours <laughs> talking about whether or not, you know, are we going? Okay, now do we run? <laughs> right. Yes. right. Yes. Now, now do we run? Right. Yes. And my character, what we did is, is that each of us picked a, a a villain that we really liked and made our version of it. Oh, sure. cool. right. So the the villain I picked was Bullseye. I picked Bullseye, and my character is a. It, it's an amalgam universe. So my character is a mutant, whose mutant ability is when I see you, I know how to kill you. Right. So I, I look at Superman, and I'm like, oh, it's Kryptonite. You know. Or I look at Batman, and you know, I know how to kill you. Right. And um, and that that's that that was the character I was playing. And I went, well, this is really easy. So all we have to do is drop me off in Gotham with a high-powered sniper rifle. I'll kill him from two and a half miles away. And everyone's like, wait a minute. We're talking about killing. Ba you think it's going to be that easy? I'm like, of course it's going to be that easy. I mean, come on. It's, he's a guy. <laughs> it's, a right? it's a guy. It's a god. It, I have a gun. There's a you god. Set up, blah, blah, blah. You set up the right shot. And they're like, well, we're, we gotta find him. We gotta. I mean, it's easy to find him. All we do is let the Joker out of Arkham and put him in, put him in, uh, in Gotham, and Batman will show up in two and a half miles. Well, bang, he's done. You know, and so the the whole discussion. And then at one point, there's this spot talking about giving people power. Um, they're like, well, all these things, and he's really smart, and you know. And I went, I went to Amanda Waller, like, I'm banging on the one way glass. I'm like, can I have a thermonuclear suitcase? I'll just drop him off in Gotham. We'll take care of Batman. Right, and and the and yes, and they're like, "Oh shit!" <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> I'm like, "What's the problem? You want Batman dead, or don't you?" You know, and and how and bad do you want? How bad do you want Batman dead? And so you know that was you know, and, but we spent four hours talking about the the talking about what to do, the practicalities of what to do, and it was so much fun because we had anything at our disposal. Anything they would have given us anything to take out Batman. Oh, as much as a bunch of dice rolling in combat is, the the best nights of gaming is when you don't even touch him, and it's just from the beginning to end a whole lot of discussion and arguing in character and out of Plotting character about playing. what's happening. Well, this yeah, is that's <laughs> well. The nice part of that is that we that whole four hours we never broke character. Right, and that was, yeah. and it wasn't like that's this intentional. Fun. We're not gonna. No, it just yeah. it just happened. And Rob recorded all of them for his podcast, right? And so I was listening back to it and I was like, we never broke, for that whole four character, we never broke character. We were just all in the moment going, what can we do? What can we do? Yeah. What can we do? I find um, 
planning sessions in games. When the, when the players have something to plan, yeah. it really becomes aversive suddenly. They are talking and acting and doing stuff completely in character because yeah. they have a, a, a plan, whether it's like a Shadowrun kind of thing or, or yeah. whatever. You know, they, they love that. But you're right. I we think need you, to cross the street. Yeah. You, you almost can't give players too much power. If you, if you do that occasionally in a campaign, my players start getting super paranoid. Like if they find the Widget of Doom kind of thing, they're like, we can just take that? It's not there. Oh, right. And then they, mm. they, they argue over the booby trap that doesn't exist right. for an entire session or it's two. It's enough time for me to get a sandwich. I, I mean, hang out. the fact that the Amber Diceless role-playing game exists mm -hmm. testifies that there is no such thing as giving the players too much power. I mean, <laughs> I mean come on. Well, but, it's like, uh, I just had a game like two weeks ago, and I had to create a character. Okay, so I created a level one cleric. However, it was a lawful evil player. Mm. And so um, it, every time that I was supposed to heal someone, I did uh, Spare the Dying. Spirit of the Dying? Spare the Dying, which doesn't really heal a person. It brings them to where they have zero hit points. However, they are no longer dead. So I've done my job. You're like the laziest cleric. I, I just I don't know if that's evil or apathetic. You're like the government worker cleric. Like, okay, you're not gonna die, we're good. Yeah. So everyone was going around the table, they're like, you are the worst cleric ever. I'm like, I did my job. At the absolute bare minimum. So, you know, some games kind of build that in. I'm a big fan of uh, I think we mentioned it a couple times, Numenera and the Cypher system, and their their hook in that is ciphers, which are usually incredibly powerful one shot items. Every version of their game, they're thematically defined different. And they're a different thing. But they're essentially badass one-shot magic items, for lack of a better term. And I've met a few GMs who kind of saw them like, oh, man, that could really throw off a game. Absolutely not. Give your players the ability to teleport anywhere in the world once. <laughs> That's awesome. That is awesome. First of all, they'll agonize forever about using it. And then they'll do it. It's one time, though. That's never going to break here on out, give your them a game device. is set in Timbuktu. Right. Give them, <laughs> give, them the, uh, give them the thermal detonator. Yeah, they'll wipe out a combat encounter instantly. One combat encounter. Maybe bring a building down with it. The repercussions of the power are awesome, and then dealing with that's always great stuff. That just, set, that just wrote its own story. It's a nice roller coaster, too, because then players have that moment of, yeah, oh, <laughs> uh-oh, now we got to deal with this. And I think that's a nice, uh, nice pacing. My, my, I've noticed with my players, they really seem to enjoy when it kind of roller coasters back and forth like that. There's these awesome moments of badassery followed by the repercussions of that, and then trying to okay scrape ourselves out of that, and then another peak. And I, I, I like that that flow that seems to get them real interested. You know, yeah. I agree with you completely. You can't give them too much power. That uh, do it to the point that they start getting paranoid of it. Well, it comes from the point of view of well then. If they're, they don't feel threatened, but if there's no monsters to threaten them, I'm like, oh, you're playing that game. Okay. Right. So we just talked about that in the last they are their worst panel, monsters. that there's yeah. so <laughs> much worse to do to players and just just kill them. I mean, that's not... I don't know. I have uh, players that are actually afraid to actually come and play with me. Um, they're like, you're going to TPK us. And I'm like, mm, not really. That is not my actual intention. They're like, well, that's what you did to the first party that you... Uh, DM for, and I'm like, yeah, that's true, but they also went into a room, set off a trap, and didn't even try to get out of that room. It's not your fault when a party kills itself. It's called, yeah, it's called giving them enough rope to hang themselves with. And sometimes they do. <laughs> there were fire elementals involved in this room. And the door was open, and all they did was fight the fire elementals. Yeah. I, I like to kind of mix it up too. I'm not a big fan of using um, this kind of sideline, but like, how are we I got I got to bounce and. Uh, oh, you got to go change. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. So go change. We'll have the room set up for you when you get cool. back. Cool. I'll be back sure. a little bit. Go uh, change for me. <laughs> I don't change for you. I change for me. No, I mean, that's the most important thing. We love you. Now change. <laughs> um, I don't like to use necessarily in games, although more and more games aren't doing this anymore. Like appropriate level encounters, I, there's things out there in the world you're going to encounter. And part of 
you, whatever character you're playing, might be to figure out if this might be a better time not to engage something. Level 30 every, dragons. Every, that, that's a, and sometimes it's obvious, like it's a great big beast thing. But I think you got to kind of train players up depending on their background in role-playing because sometimes there's, there's plenty of games where, even if they're not consciously thinking about it, players are thinking, well, we're level 5, these are going to be level 5 encounters. I mean, obviously yeah, you can take care of it. It's true. So you kind of start training them out of that until... What's nice is to build that healthy level of player paranoia where they're not always thinking, well, sure, we got weapons and equipment, we'll just kill it. You know, and they start thinking, eh, what other ways can we deal with this? What other things can go on? Or maybe that thing is just really horrible. We should just avoid it. You know, and I like getting players thinking in more directions on how they handle stuff. I think that's a, tying that to our topic, that's another way to be, I think, a, a, a good player in terms of helping your. Your GM is not always playing exactly the same way. Mixing it up, adding interesting ideas that I can build off of. Also having an interesting background story. Um, the well, PCs? Having, having hooks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Having things yeah. that hook you into the campaign. Yeah. Something that we can work with. Um, because if it's just, oh, well, I'm a character. I have I plus have- nine against ogre slaying sword, you know. Um, I, I do magic. Oh, whoop dee. That's nice. I can throw dime and hit ten of you. What I like asking uh, people when they make characters is, what's the thing you won't do? That's good. What like, are your fears? No, but not, not necessarily what your fears are, but what won't you do? It's like when you think about Bugs Bunny and Mickey Mouse. Okay? Yeah, sure. Mickey Mouse has no character. No. Oh, uh-huh. you know that's not a character. <laughs> nope. Bugs Bunny has character. Mm-hmm. It's like, will Bugs Bunny cross dress to trick a bad guy? Yes, he will. Yes, he will. Mm-hmm. And, and we know that we've because you know we, we've seen it. He routinely does it. He also, routinely. Yes. But also, Bugs Bunny leaves you alone until you bother him. Yes. And then it's on. He's you know yeah. Bugs Bunny literally is a protagonist in that he's yeah. very happy in his hole with his carrots and he's not going to do anything <laughs> until someone is playing really loud classical music and yeah. and he goes over and politely asks them to turn it off and they give him the finger so he's like okay it's on right yeah. this means war yeah right so oh, I mean you. that's you know <laughs> but yeah, Sorry, yeah it, you know so so one of the things that I always ask players is. You know, what won't your character do, right? And, you know, uh, you know the, the, the whole idea that, that Superman, who is one of my favorite comic book characters, Superman, you know, is, it can't do anything. But, but the, the, everyone's like, well, the problem with Superman is that he can do anything and it's impossible mm-hmm. to challenge him. I'm like, no, what makes Superman an interesting character is what he won't do, is what's interesting. Uh, I like how Max Landis said it. He said, Superman, when you're a Kryptonian, you have two choices. You can rule the world or save it. And, and Superman chose to save it. And wow, is that, that is an amazing choice, right? That's an interesting choice, you know? And uh, what a friend of mine once interesting. said... Interesting. Yeah, interesting. My, a friend of mine once said that uh, you can't have... The reason that the, the Superman Returns movie really, really sucked was because... There was no super fight in it, and Superman needs to be in a super fight in order for the story to be interesting. Mm-hmm. That's not true. And I was like, do you remember the original Superman movie? You liked that one, right? He's like, yeah, it's great. It's the best Superman movie. Who did he fight? Right? There's no fight, right? Because it's not about, you know... It's that's not, not the conflict. That's not physical the conflict. thing is not the conflict. Yeah. yeah. For, for Superman, a physical thing is not a conflict. I, uh, I, I mean, you can give the, you know... It's like we said before, you can give players all the power they want. It's the question of what won't you do. What won't you do defines who you are as a person, right? as a character. I like that a lot because what won't you do tells you as a GM a lot where it's I can, can create conflict. Yeah, it's where I can. That's where the conflict. It's where my antagonists are going to poke you. Yes. We can fight monsters all day long, and that's fun, but that's the hard The, the of reason the Joker works as Batman's antagonist is that the only way to resolve the Joker is to kill him. It's the only way to resolve it. Right. And it's the only thing Batman won't do. Right? It's the simple solution. That's, that's, it's simple. the simplest solution, and that's why the Joker works as a villain. The reason that Lex Luthor works as a villain is because Superman has sworn to protect the human race. And here's a human who's trying to kill him. Right. It's, it's why Superman works as a villain. The Joker can't be reasoned with, successfully incarcerated. There's nothing he can do except the one thing he wants to do. It, it, yeah. 
I just wanted that, 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 you know, what won't you do is a very good question. But it's important to then understand their answer as to this is something I won't do and I won't need to push on it because that's interesting to me, or this is something I'm not interested in doing. It, that's, yeah, that's, a different, yeah, that's a yeah. different question. Right. right. But it, it's important. I mean, they both sound the same. Is it, it's very important to understand oh, which answer you're giving. Yeah. It comes down to soft or hard limits, okay, at that point. Um, and what I mean by this is you have to ask, you have to negotiate with the player. Is this something that we can mold to? Can we explore the boundaries of this? Exactly. Or is this just off the table? Yeah. Sure, because that's more like the player's limit. Yeah. Right. I don't want right. to. Like, but like, I'm talking like, about the like, character's like, limit. Like, where's like, he at? Injury to pets or babies, just no, not going there. Right. It's, right. it's the, the last time that I ran. Dungeons and Dragons yeah. was the the players you know were going through and and killing the goblins and they killed the last goblin and it falls down and behind him is a mother you know terrified holding her children with tears rolling down her eyes yeah. and they went you broke the game <laughs> you broke why, the why game. did you do that you know well you just made a whole bunch of orphans and if you think that those little goblin kids aren't going to grow up remembering your face and they wanted to avenge you for your fa- for their for murdering their father, so that you could oh that that helmet he has is worth a halfpenny, right? Yeah, that's, that's why the peace loving goblin them, race now hates humans. Yeah. Let them, yeah, let them bring true. their first level vengeance against us. Yeah, yeah. that's true. And then did they kill them? Um, no, they they walked away, okay. and uh, and I was planned. I was prepared because goblins grow up quick. Right? Sure, six months I later, was, those are I was, goblins. Oh yeah, I was prepared. <laughs> I was fully prepared. That's and funny. Uh, yeah, and, but they, we never played again. They're like, John, you took away all the fun of the game. I'm like, this is what the game is. is. Well, and that is what's real important. I, I like doing that in whatever game I'm running. What are the what's that weak point? That moral thing they won't cross? That ethical line? Because that's where the real conflict in the story plays out. The other conflict, you know, defeating bad guys and stuff. Yeah, it may touch upon that, may not. But now you can feel more comfortable giving them the power and the stuff because that stuff doesn't really matter to them core of what you're doing. The core of what you're doing is finding out will you not, you know, use your magic to manipulate somebody in a, in a, in a harmful way, or will you continue to protect the villain, or whatever the thing is. And I think a lot of players respond well to that when you talk about that and get that into your game. Well, one of the things you have to consider about this is that once you have that list of things, it actually will divide you in, as a player. It'll make you either a hero, a anti-hero, or a villain. Um, and that is something to consider because those things, whether or not you have actually considered, makes limits. Okay, if you have no limits, then you are strictly in the villain category. However, um, the less limits you might be more in a dark anti-hero. Um, like our wonderful friend, the um, Batman. He's a villain. He's an anti-hero. He's a villain. He's not an anti-hero. He's an anti-hero. Batman causes Gotham City to happen. <laughs> he's the catalyst. He's the catalyst of Gotham catalyst. City. So if you look like all the other cities, they don't have a Batman. They're not as bad as Gotham, so it's your point. What's more is that Bruce Wayne, in, in, and if you look at Bruce Wayne, what he's turned into, Bruce Wayne has turned into this person who essentially has his own world economy. Right? He's so rich. It's totally right? true. And what? He can't solve Gotham's problems? He has to go out at night and beat people. He has to go out in the world, and he has to essentially go in the world and punch the world in his face until yeah. it gives him his mommy and daddy back? Come on! Batman. Buy happiness. You got that. Yeah, buy happiness. <laughs> Why don't you Why don't you spend some of that money on you know on restoring neighborhoods? Why don't you spend some of that money on on he improving does. the police yeah. force? No, he as, does. as opposed he to a billion dollar Batmobile. Work. Yeah, a billion dollar Batmobile. He does. <laughs> That's he, funny. He, it's all the toys that he invests in. Yes. But he also does a lot of philanthropy work as Bruce Wayne. Beating up bad guys justification for the toys. Yeah, yeah. beating yeah. up the mentally ill and the in the impoverished. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, that's a great that's way to look at a great character. <laughs> in, some, in some ways, I love Frank Miller, and in some ways, I'm just like, you just ruined Batman. It's ruined Batman. But oh well. It's about a quarter till. we got to wrap this panel up because 
the do have the I guess the cosplay contest. Yeah, next. it's true. The cosplay so contest some, is well, like some out. furniture. So yeah, I'm not bringing furniture. Thanks. No, no, no. Great. Finish furniture yeah. sandwich. Thanks a lot for coming, you guys. Thanks. Especially those who showed up at the uh, end. <laughs> yeah, I hope you enjoyed the, the four-minute panel. Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> so, thanks a lot. Four Thank you guys. Again. No problem. Absolutely. Nice meeting you. See you.